Although humans had been reporting seeing unexplained phenomena in the skies since we emerged from the mud, it was in the 20th century that the modern myth of flying saucers, unidentified flying objects, or UFOs as beings from another planet really began. Although most of the things seen have later been explained as unusual but normal phenomena, some enthusiasts continue to regard them as mysterious, and thus help perpetuate the myth that the saucers are actually spaceships from other planets, busily carrying out a patrol of the Earth. This saucer myth owes an unacknowledged debt to Charles Fort, a talented reporter, writer, and self-appointed gadfly of science. With a strong curiosity about the world of nature but without training in the disciplines of research, Fort liked to challenge scientists in general and astronomers in particular with tales of impossible happenings culled from books of folklore, old journals, and newspapers. He mistrusted orthodox knowledge because, he believed, it smugly damned to oblivion all reports of marvels that it could not explain, pyrogenic persons, rains of fish, frogs, and stones, accounts of telepathy, teleportation, the vanishing of human beings, luminous objects in the sky. Although he never claimed that he believed the stories himself, Fort enjoyed collecting them and before his death in 1932 had completed four volumes of these anecdotes. Science fiction writers have found an inexhaustible mine of ideas in the Book of the Damned, New Lands Low, and Wild Talents, which also provide the chief elements of the saucer myth. Unknown, luminous things, or beings, have often been seen, sometimes close to this earth, and sometimes high in the sky. It may be that some of them were living things that occasionally come from somewhere else in our existence, but that others were lights on the vessels of explorers, or voyagers, from somewhere else. These extraterrestrials may have been in communication with Earthmen for many years, Fort suggested, and they may sometimes kidnap and carry away human beings. The evaluation of such cases is the responsibility of the United States Air Force. Since the beginning of the saucer scare in 1947, the chief investigating agency has been that at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, and has borne a succession of names, Project Sign, Project Grudge, Project Blue Book, and the Aerial Phenomena Group of the Aerospace Technical Intelligence Center, usually known as ATIC. In military parlance the phrase unidentified flying object, abbreviated as UFO, is used to indicate any airborne phenomenon that fails to identify itself to, or to be identified by, trained witnesses on the ground or in the air who are using visual or radar methods of observation. Created in the early days of the saucer era, the term UFO is unfortunately misleading because it seems to imply that the unknown is a solid material object. Many of them are not. The more dramatic phrase flying saucer is similarly misleading because not all the unknowns are shaped like a saucer, and not all of them are flying. Since no one has been able to devise a more accurate brief term that will apply to all reports in this category, both UFO and flying saucer have remained in common use. The overture to the Flying Saucer Opera took place in the summer of 1947, presenting the main themes that were to develop with fantastic variations during the 15-year-long drama that followed, mysterious apparitions in the sky, alleged interplanetary visitors, government investigators, growing public excitement, civilians who zealously encouraged the hysteria, and, as a climax, an elaborate hoax that produced material evidence to prove the existence of spaceships. The first man to report a flying saucer was a veteran pilot named Kenneth Arnold, representative of a fire control equipment firm in Boise. On the afternoon of June 24 Arnold was flying a private plane on his way from Chehalis to Yakima. Above the Cascade Mountains at about 9,200 feet, he noticed a series of bright flashes in the sky off to his left. Looking for the cause, he saw what appeared to be a formation of peculiar aircraft approaching Mount Rainier at fantastic speed. There were nine very bright, disc-shaped objects which he estimated to be 20 to 25 miles away, 45 to 50 feet long, and traveling at a speed of almost 1,700 miles an hour. Talking with a reporter that evening, 
Arnold said that the objects flew like a saucer would if you skipped it across the water. In a later report to Air Force Intelligence he stated, they were flat like a pie pan, and so shiny they reflected the sun like a mirror. Newspapers all over the country picked up the story and printed it under headlines describing flying pies, flying pie pans, and flying saucers. Alert to the possibility that the objects might have been a new type of aircraft of Russian origin, investigators from military intelligence interviewed Arnold and officials from air technical intelligence requested a report. No one doubted Arnold's word. He was an experienced pilot, a respected citizen, and a careful observer. Nevertheless his description showed some inconsistencies that made it difficult to decide what the nine discs really were. Even after a careful study, Air Force investigators could not identify the discs, they might have been clouds, a mirage, or some kind of aircraft, but no definite answer was possible from the evidence available. Predictably, after so much publicity, a rash of similar sightings broke out all over the country and continued for the rest of the summer. During the hot months of the silly season, newspapers were traditionally hospitable to tales of barnyard freaks, sea serpents, and man-bitten dogs. Such stories were now shoved aside as people in every state began to report unorthodox objects sailing through the sky, flying discs, flying dimes, flying ice cream cones, flying shoe heels, and flying hubcaps. Seeing saucers became a national pastime, but Arnold, who had reported the strange objects in all good faith, resented the implied ridicule. Deluged with telephone calls and mail, he resolved to keep silent in the future even if he should happen to see a ten-story building flying through the air. In spite of the publicity, the flying saucer scare would probably have died with the first frost of autumn but for the efforts of a talented writer, editor, and publisher of science fiction, Raymond A. Palmer. Among the many letters Arnold received was one from Palmer, then editor of Amazing Stories. Tired of being laughed at, Arnold found the tone of sincere interest so appealing that he answered the letter. After a second letter a week later, he changed his mind about keeping silent and agreed to sell his story for publication. Under the title, I Did See the Flying Discs, the article appeared in the first issue of a new magazine, Fate, which published true stories of the strange, the unusual, the unknown. Although Arnold was not a professional writer, he had the assistance of an expert and produced a vivid, clearly written story. Interesting differences between Arnold's original statements and those in the magazine version demonstrate how much he must have owed to editorial help. Without it, he might not have included certain colorful details that he had apparently overlooked earlier. In his original reports, for example, he said that he had at first supposed the discs to be some type of experimental aircraft, in the magazine version he added that, even at the time, the objects had given him an eerie feeling. In the intervening months he had also remembered more about their shape. He no longer described them as saucer-like, flat and shiny like pie pans. Instead, a drawing based on his revised account shows an object like the crescent moon with a sharp protrusion on the inner, concave side and a dark, mottled circle marking the center of the top surface. Furthermore, he told the readers of fate, one object had been darker than the others and of a slightly different form, a detail he had forgotten to mention to reporters, to military officials, to his friends, or even to his wife. Arnold had never been much of a reader and was not a science fiction fan, but his interests were obviously widening. The next two issues of fate carried other articles under his name. Palmer's growing influence is suggested by the titles, Are Space Visitors Here? and Phantom Lights of Nevada. Ray Palmer lays claim to being the first flying saucer investigator, although he frankly admits his debt to the writings of Charles Fort. He not only opened the pages of his magazines to the first saucer reports but also, in the beginning, paid the witnesses for their stories. In 1947 Palmer was the editor of Amazing Stories and Fantastic Adventures, two of the great magazines of science fiction in which stories of spaceships and interplanetary travel, have long been commonplace. For several years, 
he had been hinting to readers of these magazines that alien spaceships might actually be cruising in our skies, but Fate was the first magazine that seriously promoted the idea. No man was better qualified to glimpse the dramatic possibilities of flying saucers. Born in Wisconsin in 1910, Palmer had begun reading Amazing Stories soon after it started publication in 1926. Turning to writing, he showed the remarkable persistence that has characterized his life. Although he received 100 rejections before he sold his second story, he stubbornly kept on until he not only achieved success as an author but also, in 1938, became managing editor of Amazing Stories for the Ziff Davis Publishing Company. Under Palmer's guidance, the entertainment side of science fiction took over. Gone were the ponderous styles, the verbiage, the highly technical explanations of what mattered little in the first place. The stories took on pace and excitement, the characters in them were faced with human problems, the dialogue was realistic. Alert to the tastes of his readers, Palmer carried the magazine to new heights. Many science fiction fans, including the present speaker, still remember that golden age around 1940 when Amazing came out every month with 146 pages full of startling, fantastic, wonderful stories of how life might be on other worlds and in other galaxies. In January 1944 began the publishing drama that for a time changed the direction of Amazing and heralded the advent of flying saucers. The discussions department that month included a letter captioned an ancient language which introduced what came to be known both as the Great Shaver Mystery and the Great Shaver Hoax. Signed S. Shaver, the letter began. Sirs, am sending you this in hopes you will insert in an issue to keep it from dying with me. It would arouse a lot of discussion. It did indeed. The letter announced the discovery that words and syllables of the ancient Atlantean language still exist in English today, hence the legends of Atlantis must be true and a wiser race than modern man must once have existed on the earth. Richard Sharp Shaver was then living in Bartow, Pennsylvania, and operated a welding machine in a war plant. In writing to thank the editor for publishing his letter, he enclosed a manuscript called Warning to Future Man which purported to give his memories of life in the fabled continent of Lemuria. The information had been preserved in thought records hidden in secret caves. By Telaug, a kind of audiovisual telepathy, he had begun to remember his forgotten past when, through the noise of his welding machine, he heard voices. After visiting Shaver and probing his memories, Palmer bought the story. He didn't like the way it was written, however, so he rewrote it, added material that expanded it to three times its original length, changed the title to I Remember Lemuria, and started advertising it well in advance of publication as a true story. Twelve thousand years ago the Lemurians and the Atlanteans disappeared from the Earth. Where and why did they go? This story would show that Newton and Einstein were all wrong, Palmer promised, and would reveal new concepts of gravity, the nature of matter, and the foundation for physical mathematics. Thus began the controversy that rocked the world of science fiction. Since Palmer affirmed that flying saucers are a part of the Shaver mystery. Integrally so, we turn to the old files of amazing stories to trace their development. The first of the Shaver series, I remember Lemuria appeared in March 1945, along with Mantong, The Language of Lemuria, an article signed by both Shaver and Palmer, and other stories followed quickly in succeeding issues of Amazing. The basic themes were shopworn, a jumble of Fortean ideas, Plato's fables, and mystic science, but when brightened by Palmer's magic pencil, they seemed fresh and exciting, the earth had an ancient past, now forgotten. The lost continents of Atlantis, Lemuria, and Mu had been colonized many thousands of years ago by superior beings from another planet who could travel through space by utilizing forces unknown to present-day Earthmen. Eventually these noble aliens had been forced to abandon the Earth to escape evil radiations coming from our Sun, but they had left descendants who still lived on Earth in concealment in great subterranean cities that could be entered through certain caves. 
The underground dwellers in the hidden world had retained all the secret powers of their ancestors. They could communicate by thought transference, could speak to earthmen by mental voices, and could travel on beams of light because they understood the true nature of gravity and magnetism. These creatures were divided into two opposing groups, one good and one evil. The Dero, detrimental robots, were the bad guys and they caused all the unexplained accidents and misfortunes that happen to human beings. The Tero, integrative robots, were the good guys, they warned Earthmen of danger and tried to protect them from the destructive forces of the Dero. Reader response to these fantasies was phenomenal. Fan mail zoomed from 40 or 50 to 2,500 letters a month, and the magazine's circulation increased by some 50,000. As the records of racial memory continued to appear, connoisseurs of good science fiction began to cry hoax. But their protests had no effect. Thousands of new readers were buying the magazine and many of them were beginning to recall and report memories of their own. Since the discussions columns could not take care of so many letters, Palmer opened a new department, Report from the Forgotten Past, and urged the readers to send in their personal experiences with the hidden world. Did you ever hear strange voices? Receive mysterious messages through the air? Suspect that you were being affected by strange rays? Feel that you had been put on Earth for some special mission? Have dreams that you could not explain? Have a strong urge to explore caves? Have memories of other lives? The editor is eager to learn of all such incidents. Devotees of reasonable science fiction, who include many leading scientists, were writing angrily to Palmer, protesting that the Shaver hoax had gone too far, but their letters seemed only to amuse him. We realize that a lot of our readers find it difficult to believe that we ourselves believe one single word of what Mr. Shaver tells us in his stories, but we'll keep on presenting the evidence as it comes in, and you can judge for yourself. Readers continued to object and many stopped buying the magazine, but Palmer persisted with ambiguous hints that spaceships were really here. A full year before the first flying saucer report he wrote, If you don't think spaceships visit the Earth regularly, as in this story, Cult of the Witch Queen, then the files of Charles Ford and your editor's own files are something you should see. And if you think responsible parties in world governments are ignorant of the fact of spaceships visiting Earth, you just don't think the way we do. As for spaceships, personally we believe these ships do visit the Earth. You, or any observer, would be inclined to call it something else if you did see one. In June 1947, the month the first flying saucers were reported, the issue of amazing stories was an addict's dream. The cover featured the Shaver mystery, the most sensational true story ever told, the four stories, 90,000 words, were all under the byline of Richard S. Shaver. The entire magazine, editorial comments, discussion columns, and most of the feature articles, was devoted to the supernatural world of Shaver. But the end was near? Amazing published its last Shaver story, Gods of Venus, in the summer of 1948. As far as the magazine was concerned, the mystery was dead. Who or killed it? One version says that the publisher, William B. Ziff, ordered the series stopped because so many fans had quit buying the magazine. Palmer himself has given various explanations. He stopped the stories, he said at first, when he realized that such material did not really belong in a fiction magazine. Later still, he implied that publishing the stories was dangerous, that he had learned too much about the hidden world, said Palmer, I wanted no more dead men on my hands.